So we are not your road. Um, this is my rejection and my sort of suggestion for how we might overcome sort of split consciousness in a sense by using the split consciousness. Um, I would like to get my notes here if I've got them. Okay, so is there a way to read these works as an act of feminist subversion? I think that we need to, when I say split consciousness here, um, what I mean by this, are you guys familiar with the concept of the male gaze? And I always have to say this to my students, Z-E, not gaze, <laughs> the male gaze. Okay, um, so it's a, if you're not familiar with the, the, like the, the terminology of this, the male gaze, um, John Berger is probably, or Berger, however you say his name, it's probably the guy who describes it best, but it's a, an idea, it's a cultural phenomenon. It is not something that men do to women. I think that's very important to remember. A person can experience the male gaze all by themselves alone, and they can experience it in their dreams. It's not an act that men do to women. It's a cultural phenomenon whereby women are the objects of sight and men are the subjects of viewing. Um, and so this, this idea about sort of like the literal visual gaze gets kind of transformed into how we think about people approach reading, how we approach watching films. And feminist film theory has adopted this in a very useful way. And what feminist film th theorists argue is that the male gaze is so omnipresent, we can't ever escape it. Um, and so when I go to a movie as a woman, according to feminist film theory, most protagonists in films are men, right? I have because I've internalized the male gaze, the male gaze not only um, is, I, I experience myself as an object of sight, I actually incorporate the male gaze into my own consciousness and I watch myself being looked at. So uh, Berger, has a, uh, Berger has this beautiful quote, he says, men learn to look at women, women learn to look at themselves being looked at by men. The, what is it, the spectator in her, in her is male, the, the, the viewed is female. So she's split in half, and she watches herself and has an internalized man. W.E.B. Du Bois said the same thing about double consciousness for black people, that there's a constant split duality, that black people experience a white vision watching them at all times, that there's no whole consciousness. Um, it's a real bummer. If you've, if you've done more experiences, like, it kind of, once you become aware, like, it really sucks to have this split consciousness, to, to, ha to know the, this is internalized gaze, and to see, when you, when you read stuff like this, if you are not a white dude, and you're like, God damn, you lucky son of a bitch, I would love your wholeness. Like, I would love the chance to write like I was God. Um, but hold on. It's going to be okay. Because, <laughs> it's going to be okay. Because, the value of split consciousness then, so when I watch a movie, according to feminist film theory, I identify with the male subject. Does that make sense? Because um, we, we all identify with the protagonist. So you're saying, someone said they identify with Jack, right? The idea in feminist film theory, it, like a woman will necessarily, if a, if a woman's being objectified as like the thing to be sought after, the story around, like the, the catalyst for achievement. The guy becomes a dude because he did the thing and he gets the girl at the end, right? But he is the protagonist. He's the one who has a journey. Nobody's going to watch that movie. If they're, if they're a woman, they're not going to identify with the inner object. Everyone's going to identify with the actor, right? Um, and so women have this experience, but then they also want to be the object because they want to be desired. So we want, we identify with both. We have split consciousness in a way that men don't. Gail, our bell hooks, a feminist film, uh, a black feminist film theorist, argues that the more oppressed a group of people are, the farther away they get from that gaze and from that object, and they can begin to see the whole thing in operation. Does that make sense? She argues, actually, that black women have a thing called the oppositional gaze because they're so thoroughly degraded in film. Like, nobody wants to be the maid and the help. Does that make sense? Nobody looks at that and like, that's who I want to be. You might want to be Jennifer Aniston if you, she gets the guy. Does that make sense? But nobody wants to be, she's like, black women are so degraded in film. The black women actually have the greatest power to tell us what films are about because they don't, they don't identify with anyone. Does that make sense? They're just like, they can actually see it in operation. So what I'm suggesting here is that because as women and people of color can actually see something in this book that no white man and definitely not Jack Kerouac could see. 
As much as this book helps to set a lot of people free, it helped to set me free. It was a revolutionary experience for me reading it. What I would say is what we have that he doesn't have, um, yes, only a white man could write this story. And I also want to say, like, in forgiveness and sort of celebration of him, and thank God a white man did write it. Does that, like, I'm so glad he needed to save himself too and needed to free himself as well, because I do think he was in a form of prison as well. Um, but only by being sort of um, having the ability to take on the protagonist experience and the objectified experience can we start to get a sense of what the story is actually about. We're the only ones. This is, what, this is my, okay, it's, everything's gonna, not going to suck. I think that where I find a sense of wholeness reading the book is kind of arriving at this fact that I can tell Jack Kerouac what his book is about. He doesn't know what it's about. Only others have the ability to see the entire picture. So does that make sense? I can actually see the women in the book that he can't see. I can, and um, I'm, I'm white, so I can't, I can't see all the functionings of race here, but I think I have a better vision of perhaps than he does how race functions to tell his story. So I can tell him in better terms than he can the entirety of the story because I am left outside of it. And in a sense, it's not that I want to like, make him my bitch and that I hate him, but I can, um, I can take sort of the freedom that this is woven into the story without letting it objectify me in the reading of it. So this is my last point here. Um, what is the book about then? If I say, like, only I can tell him, then I better have something to say, right? <laughs> um, and I will, I haven't, I haven't, I haven't developed my thoughts here yet, but there, this is my one thing that I wish I could tell Jack um, and many authors like him. The thing that, the saddest failure of his blindness, I think, the thing that he wasn't capable of seeing, and honestly, there's no way, to, I don't think he could have seen it, is that the thing that he most wanted to resist, right, conformity, domesticity, conservatism, um, you know, jello molds, whatever, garlic presses, he has upheld it. Until you reject patriarchy, you are the monster. Like he, his story reaffirms the dichotomies that he thinks he's breaking down. And so that's, where, that's what we can offer him. So you're welcome, Jack. <laughs> Thank you.